Good afternoon, participants uh, of this uh, third day of the UCAN ULL Open Forum 2021. And as you know, this is our third week, and our main topic for this week is uh, flexible learning and more elaborately designing flexible learning for adults, dialogue between university lifelong learning and professional contexts. And while I was uh, uh, searching uh, topics for this, uh, this uh, week, I came across uh, Maureen's uh, research and I found it very interesting. And, and I'm so happy that today we can, we can listen to your thoughts and, and discuss later on after your presentation about the, the findings and, and also the, the organizational development in your own university in, in Utah. And uh, maybe it's, uh, it's easier if, if you present yourself as, so that we hear from your professional role and how, how did you come across this topic in your own work and uh, what kind of agenda do you have in mind in maybe also wi more widely in in the US for flexible learning, because at least here in, in Finland and other European countries, this really is a hot topic of the moment, how to how the universities or higher education institutions can be more flexible and how can that be made a, a reality. But please, um, Maureen, the floor is yours. And uh, after your presentation, we hopefully have a, a very fruitful discussion. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Timo. Uh, I will go ahead and share my screen. And first, I'd just like to say I really appreciate this invitation to share what we've been doing at my university and to share a little bit about the US context and flexible learning. So I am currently a professor in the School of Business, but prior to that, I was um, an associate vice president at the university and responsible for um, distance learning or flexible learning and um, curriculum and academic programs. And it was in that role that I uh, worked with my team to develop this framework. So I will tell you about the framework, um, the different parts of the framework. And then interestingly, um, even though we didn't know it at the time, this framework really helped prepare us for COVID-19. So we didn't anticipate COVID-19, of course, but um, it gave us a good uh, foundation for what we needed to do during that time. So uh, we all probably have some somewhat different perspectives on what flexible learning is and also how it's tied to lifelong learning, which is of interest in Europe and also in the US, definitely. Um, in my own university, we have a lot of students that we call non-traditional students who are uh, returning to get uh, credentials and so forth, uh, changing careers and that kind of thing. Uh, so we need to address the needs of all of those students. And I know you've had other presenters this week who have talked about different pathways for flexible learning and um, uh, lifelong learning. So uh, in this context, um, lifelong learning, or sorry, flexible learning focuses on the place, pace, mode, and access of learning. So the place is not, the place moves from on campus to off campus. The mode of learning moves from face to face to online or using technology. The pace, um, there's the range from self-paced, uh, which is more flexible than time bound sitting in the classroom in a specific um, class time. 
and then open access versus restricted access where uh, where you might have more admission requirements and so forth. So more flexibility across those dimensions. Uh, options for how, what, when, and where learning occurs is the basic definition. So what does it involve? Um, rethinking how we do teaching and learning, rethinking the policies and paradigms and the culture within our institutions <clears throat> that have governed traditional forms of delivery. And to do this, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> successfully um, to change uh, how we're doing things in an institution, everyone needs a voice. There are all kinds of stakeholders. There are students, staff, administrators, um, people responsible for all different aspects of the university and how we deliver uh, education. And we definitely need to involve everyone. Uh, also, uh, for the last several years, there's been a real move to democratize higher education and admit more students, a more diverse student body. And to do that, we need to help all students be successful. So students are coming to us with a lot different needs, um, learning needs and uh, lifestyles and backgrounds than they did previously. So we need to find ways to help all of them be successful and be inclusive of the range of students that we serve. So that's kind of a broader picture of what um, flexible learning involves. So, okay, so at Utah Valley University, um, one of the things that pushed us in the direction of flexible learning, we have had increasing enrollments. So we moved from about 26,000 students in 2008 to 30, almost 40,000 in 2018 and 41,000 in 2020, and we're projected to just keep increasing. And we can't meet the needs of all of those students. We can't just build more buildings and more parking spaces. <laughs> so we had to come up with something more <clears throat> innovative to help <clears throat> uh, serve all of those students. And <clears throat> the in, sorry, <clears throat> it's still early in the morning here. I haven't talked that much yet. Um, <clears throat> so the increase in enrollment is due to just population growth. Utah is an in-migration state. We have um, increasing population. And then we, we just have more students in our school system who are graduating and wanting to go to university. And then, as I mentioned, we have a lot of non-traditional students. So um, on the right hand here, you can see that we have first generation students, which means that neither parent has completed a bachelor's degree, minority students, that's different ethnic minorities. Um, about a third of our students are 25 years old or older. 38% um, are married or have a partner, 17% support children. 81% are employed. So students are really having to balance work, family, school. And that is another strong reason to provide options in pace, place, and mode of delivery of education. All right, so the impetus for flexible learning was this growing student body, the limited physical space. Our campus is only so big, we don't have the budget to build more buildings. Um, this should say body, increasingly diverse student body. And uh, so the response was definitely to expand our capacity through flexible delivery. And as I mentioned, this, is, this was all pre-COVID. So we were working towards this 
um, for quite a, uh, a period of time. So the strategy, I'm going to talk about the strategy we used and how we implemented um, this new direction. So we did some restructuring in terms of, we had a unit responsible for distance learning and we had a unit responsible for faculty development, or I think in Europe you would call it academic staff. Um, we created a new office of teaching and learning and we um, added funding to that office to build the expertise of our academic staff and have more instructional designers and technologists to be able to support the development of different delivery modalities and use of technology. Uh, and then we also, um, so our distance education unit used to be in a, a kind of autonomous on its own, but we moved more of that into the departments um, so that they would have more ownership over courses offered in different delivery modes. Uh, and then we did, we used to give a stipend for teaching online courses. Um, we eliminated that and we just said teaching online or blended courses is just a regular part of what all professors do. But we do still give a stipend um, to develop courses in different delivery modalities. So this is the framework. It looks a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> um, so this was really uh, the vision to focus on the goals that we had to address the educational needs in our region. So the growing student body, the more diverse student body, um, you know, the, the age of the students, the fact that students worked and needed more more options for getting an education rather than just coming to class and sitting in a classroom. So we um, worked on all these different elements and I'm gonna just briefly talk about each and then I'll go into um, explaining how this set a foundation for what happened during COVID. So it was a holistic approach to high quality flexible learning. So first we looked at the vision and I've kind of talked about this already, but um, the vision to provide education to students within our region in, a, in different delivery modalities to reflect our students, our increasing enrollments, um, their needs for different types of scheduling and to decrease the time to graduation. So we had instructional design, we hired in additional instructional designers, we created workshops and trainings for the academic staff, uh, and we require all academic staff who are teaching courses to do a certification in teaching online. Um, we expanded our institutional expertise with more staff, um, giving priority to hiring staff who could um, help us achieve these goals for um, flexible learning. We brought in consultants and guest speakers to help um, develop both staff and academic staff. Uh, so within the Office of Teaching and Learning that we created, we developed what we called staff champions who were experts on different areas of flexible learning. And that was a very positive thing for them because um, it engaged them and gave them opportunities for professional growth. Uh, policies, we had to review our, all of our policies um, and change some of our policies. Uh, I've talked a little bit about compensation and fees and so forth and budgets. Um, and, and shifting responsibilities. So this was fairly involved, but if you're making big changes, um, you need to look at your structures and your policies to make sure they support uh, flexible learning modalities. Uh, 
So this was kind of interesting. Um, in the old model where we had distance education as kind of a separate unit, we actually charge students extra to take online courses. <laughs> So um, one of the things we did was eliminate that because that's a, a barrier and not every, you know, most students don't want to pay extra. So that, that was just one example of some of the things we had to work through. Uh, we also looked at analytics. So uh, looking at how students, how successful students were in courses, uh, progress and challenges and sharing that information with decision makers and leaders at the university uh, and creating data dashboards to track student success across different delivery modalities. So constantly getting that, that data to feed decision making. Quality assurance. So this one, um, over time, we've developed a rubric and every class that's offered either as a blended course, um, hybrid or blended, or an online course um, goes through a quality assurance measure where it gets reviewed by peers. Um, students who are taking the course when it's piloted give feedback. Um, so all of these things to develop more expertise among the academic staff and to increase confidence in the quality. So one of the, I guess, hesitations or types of resistance that online learning often encounters is it's not as good as face-to-face, -face, the quality is low, uh, there's no interaction, uh, but you can definitely address that through uh, instructional good quality instructional design and having standards and review procedures. Uh, so we have trained reviewers. Every course needs to be certified and reviewed. Um, <clears throat> and, and these courses actually have more scrutiny than in-person courses, which is kind of interesting to me. All right, so then we also had a lot of strategic campaigns um, to promote uh, developing courses in different modalities. So we had a big push towards hybrid, which is partly in-person and partly online. So at the time, the president of our university just really thought that hybrid was the way to go. Um, so there was a big push and we had different campaigns and marketing and so forth and kind of, um, Hybrid is the new normal, hybrid is double awesome. And then at that time we wanted 20 courses by 2020. Um, I think we've far surpassed that now because everything got accelerated with uh, COVID. So creative messaging and getting um, academic staff, what we call faculty on board to increase the number of courses in different delivery modalities, primarily online and hybrid. And then COVID also introduced some different modalities as well. Uh, student success was really important because there's always kind of a perception that if um, you're not in an in-person course with the professor and other students, um, students sometimes feel like they're not gonna be as successful. They're gonna be on their own and not have the support they need. So we really coordinated this with different um, groups and committees on campus who were looking at the different populations of students we serve and their needs to make sure um, that they understood what was involved in an online or hybrid course and that they had um, support. So they have 24 hours, seven day a week support for the technology um, that we use to deliver the courses. We have orientation videos, tutorials, and then once again, we're con we continue to track how students do. Um, faculty development. So um, we did quite a bit of creative thinking on this to recognize faculty um, who were developing courses, um, 
giving them a certificate for their training, giving them stipends for developing courses, um, just showcasing and honoring faculty who were really effective in online and hybrid course delivery. So awards, um, showcases, events, um, workshops, uh, trainings uh, to really kind of motivate and get the word out about the good work people were doing in this area. Uh, shared governance, of course, is important. Um, looking at all the, the advisory groups and um, making sure that the faculty, the professors teaching the courses had oversight for the quality assurance and for the courses that were being developed. And that would increase confidence in the quality of the courses. And um, so right now, um, this has, as the slide indicates, evolved. Um, but the, the professors are responsible for quality assurance with support from the teaching and learning office. And then there's also a committee of faculty and administrators that are kind of more the big picture part of the plan. And then this was, I've mentioned analytics and data a few times, but this was a kind of a recent development. Uh, we collected data that showed students who took one online course had higher retention and graduation rates than those who did not enroll in online courses. So this really was impressive to our professors because they want to help students succeed. So this was a student-centered argument. So if students who are taking an online course are more successful in, a, in staying at the university and graduating from the university, then that's a reason to do online courses. And probably the reason for that is simply um, kind of scheduling and, and access. So the whole idea of flexible learning, um, what, when, where you study um, by giving students online courses or um, different choices, um, they're more likely to be able to complete their requirements and graduate. Uh, shared understanding, um, this is related to making information very transparent and widely available. So the Office of Teaching and Learning sends out regular emails uh, providing support and listing all the different trainings and practice sessions they're doing. And this became really important during COVID. So during COVID, courses that weren't being offered online um, switched to what we call live stream, which is basically um, we use Microsoft Teams, which is similar to Zoom. So courses were taught over, over Zoom instead of in the classroom or over Microsoft Teams, but really no one knew how to use Microsoft Teams. <laughs> so so oh, there was a lot of training for students and for the professors and tutorials and, um, and the, that, so that was constant communication and making information and training available and technology updates. So new technology had to be installed in the classrooms to record, um, to record classes that were given in class. Um, so if students couldn't come to class, they could watch the recordings. So there was a whole variety of changes and that um, required uh, information to be timely and um, transparent and, and readily available and accessible. All right, so COVID-19, I've already gotten into this a little bit, but um, so obviously we all had to do rapid response. Um, you know, we shut down and we had to figure out what to do and how to deliver our courses. So because we had done all of this preliminary work with the framework, um, that basic infrastructure was already in place. 
So we had the Office of Teaching and Learning, we had instructional designers, we had experts um, in technology. Uh, so we were able to pivot fairly quickly to move nearly all courses to some kind of technology supported distance or flexible modality. So we had training and support in place, but up until COVID, our progress had been very incremental. So um, I mentioned the live stream technology that was new and all the training that had to go with it. Um, we accelerated um, the websites with information, the videos, the workshops, um, a lot of trainings um, we were able to offer uh, attendees stipends uh, because we had we had COVID money from, from the state government. Uh, and then community and networking opportunities. So throughout, I guess, the whole year of 2020, um, our Office of Teaching and Learning um, sponsored a number of pan panels, kind of like um, opportunities like what we're, you're doing, um, where people were sharing the work they were doing um, and people were getting ideas from each other about how to teach in these new modalities. So there was rapid course redesign, um, but with faculty oversight. So everyone was kind of engaged and working um, full speed. Um, communication was really critical. Uh, all levels of the university, timely and informative updates. Um, a lot of communication and guidance was given related to how to help and support students. So being flexible in terms of um, their needs, their, their needs with technology, um, if they had health issues, reaching out to them and being proactive, um, letting them know what modality the classes would be taught in and um, social distancing and all of those things were just so critical. So, uh, of course, um, we looked at data at the percentage of students who were enrolled online, which greatly increased and the number of faculty who were receiving various types of training, especially the live stream training increased. We looked at failure rates um, by gender, ethnicity, and age to help us pinpoint where students needed the most help. Uh, we had faculty surveys, we had student satisfaction surveys, um, just to see how things were going and monitoring progress uh, and what was working and what wasn't. Um, attendance was tracked in the physical classes and the um, remote and recorded session. So once again, a lot of data and communicating that data and using that data to make decisions was important. So key lessons. Um, strategic planning is critical to identify threats and opportunities. Um, we were already planning uh, to be more flexible in how we delivered education and supported lifelong learning and looking at who our students were and what their needs were. Um, never could have uh, anticipated COVID, but that strategic planning really helped us. Um, we needed a range and depth of expertise to help us um, reach our vision to be more flexible. Uh, ongoing, consistent, and transparent communication uh, in times of crisis and even before we, we got to the crisis. Um, the framework helped us consider all the different elements of the university and how to involve them and make sure we hadn't left any pieces out. So stakeholder input, um, assessment of experiences to inform decisions and, and actions. 
And then the use of mentoring and role models. So faculty helping other faculty figure out what works, what doesn't work, um, what's effective, how do we help students, how do we use technology, and then just a real culture of collaboration and shared decision making um, was very important. So this is kind of the key takeaway. Um, while the pandemic accelerated interest, support, and understanding of the need for flexible learning among stakeholders, we had a foundation for it um, due to the framework we had in place and what we were working towards as part of our strategic planning at the university. All right, so all of this information, as Timo mentioned, is actually in this article that I co-authored um, with a colleague who was responsible for the Office of Teaching and Learning at that time. So for more detail, you can go to that article. And other than that, I will open things up for questions. Thank you, Maureen. It was, it was very, very interesting. and. Uh, such a systematic model that you you were able to create and and the pandemic really put it into a hard test <laughs> so to say yes yeah there has been a, a few questions um so um i think from carme there was a, a really a detailed question about what it, which is the percentage of major students, mature students, enrolling in your courses and degrees. I think you mentioned something about the, the different kinds of a student body composition yeah. that quite yeah, many yeah. were already mature. <laughs> there were, uh, I know, there was a lot of details in the presentation. Let me just look at, um, show you that slide again. So, um, we had 30% that are 25 years old or older. So about of our third of our students. So in the US, um, if you're 25 or older, the term we use is non-traditional students. Um, and then we have quite a large proportion that are married, have children, a huge number that are employed. Um, Nearly half are working more than 21 hours a week and about a quarter, 31 hours per week or more. Yeah. So it's it's not so much the 18 year olds, but it's, you know, they're a little older than that. Yeah. So even even that composition of the students uh, require this development of maybe more part time study mode than really the full-time study or mode of uh, 18 year old uh, students enrolling yes yes exactly i mean these demographics are what pushed us helped push us in the direction of um, flexible learning because we wanted to help students graduate and if you've got if you're working if you have a family if you're older um you don't have time to just um, attend class when it's convenient for the professor to teach. <laughs> you exactly. need, yeah, you need um, greater availability and different modalities of, of coursework. Exactly. There was another question from um, Susan. So um, she commented something about the the maybe the financial uh, incentives for faculty members either for uh, there was the, the quality reviewer idea or then there was some more like a teaching online would you like to ask susan yourself if you had more 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 there in in your mind please yes thank you maureen that was a, a great presentation very interesting as well and i know you mentioned you did provide stipends for 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 various things and i wondered when the professors became certified in teaching online, if you had a, a stipend exactly for that, and are you able to share how much it was? Sure. 
So um, the stipend for the certification course is $2,000. And then the stipend for developing an online or hybrid course, um, it comes to $3,500 and they get it in two parts. So they complete kind of the plan and they get $1,000 and then they complete, there, there are different milestones that they complete um, when they get those, to get those stipends. And then I'll just add, um, so a lot of the trainings and conferences we've had that were, are more short term, like two to three day conferences, um, we've actually been able to pay faculty 100 to $200 to attend those. And they fill out a little survey after the sessions they've attended and indicate kind of rate the session, indicate what they've learned and how they might implement it. And then they get a certificate for completing those. Then there's been quite a range of those sessions um, throughout the last year and a half. And just a little added bonus um, for attending them has been really nice. That's great. I actually work in Florida and uh, we received COVID money from the government too. And I just wondered, so were you able to to fund all this through the COVID money or did you have to make budget cuts elsewhere to, to you know, to fund all this and eliminating like the students um, online fee, that's quite a lot. Yeah, um, so some of that was done pre-COVID. So eliminating the student fee, you know, when we started um, building towards more flexible learning, uh, we eliminated the student fee at that time. And we started building the infrastructure for more instructional designers and so forth. So every year through the budget process, we set priorities and this was definitely a priority. And then, uh, so we always gave faculty members a stipend for developing online courses. So that was in place. Um, we did get a lot of COVID money. Uh, which helped, um, it's funded paying faculty for training um, for these kind of mini conferences and workshops. I think we've hired more people in the Office of Teaching and Learning Technology, technology in the classrooms um, to do the live stream. So we've used it in a lot of different ways, but some of it was already in place because we just We've been moving in that direction. Right. Very good. Thanks. Yeah. I was also very pleased to see, see you um, highlighted the, the question of a quality assurance. Because uh, on Monday, we had uh, the speaker from uh, UNESCO. And she mentioned in her presentation that uh, this is really lacking in higher education institutions that, that although we have had this so-called forced uh, transition to online learning, but still all these um, methods or structures for quality assurance on technology enhanced learning are missing. But you okay. seem to have this, uh, this model of peer assessment and then all the learning analytics, this collecting feedback. So th there was a quite many ways of uh, doing the quality assurance. Yes, that's true. Uh, and that, you know, that's developed over time, but uh, we do have a pretty strong process in place with the quality assurance rubric. So I'm on the committee that's responsible for that. And um, each course is reviewed by three different faculty members and they're all trained on the rubric before that. And then the faculty member gets those reviews and has to respond to them and make changes. Um, and then we review every course um, every three years uh, and make sure it's updated and current and um, faculty can make changes to it at that time. Um, and then the Office of Teaching and Learning, they're kind of 
they've got all the real experts in terms of instructional design and technology. They also review and give feedback. And when we when um, faculty members design a course, they start with a course design plan that gets reviewed first, and then they develop the course, and then it, it's reviewed with the rubric and, and so on and so forth. So it's taken some time to get that in place, but it seems to be working fairly well. And um, because uh, the academic staff or the faculty are actually responsible for it, there's more buy-in because it's not someone in the administration looking at what we're doing and telling us what to do. Yeah, so it's really in the among the teachers or also the the incentive for for quality and not, not just somewhere out uh, outside in, in yeah, a distant yeah. office or something. There's a, a question from uh, Ulle. So there was mentioned a certification of courses. Was the certification system already in place or you worked it out for online courses, hybrid learning? Yeah, the certification, um, before COVID, it was being developed, but it wasn't, it wasn't completely in place. So we had to accelerate during COVID, we accelerated the number of courses we put online. And of course, there was concern with the quality, which I think has been a problem in a lot of different contexts. In our state, for example, in um, like primary and secondary school, they weren't very well prepared to do things online or live stream or technology based. So online learning has gotten kind of a negative uh, people, I'd say the general public has kind of a negative view of it because um, people had to do it so quickly and they weren't prepared and it wasn't necessarily well done in the beginning. Um, but we actually had the certification course for faculty training developed and we were phasing it phasing in the requirement that faculty would have to take the course before they could teach online. And the same was true with the rubric used to measure the quality of the courses. Um, that was already developed, but once again, COVID just accelerated everything and we formed. Um, so each school and college has a committee that oversees its online courses and the quality of those courses. And they're, they're the ones that do the, the peer reviews with the rubric. Oh, and we get paid $200 for each review that we do. <laughs> so what's yeah. the point that? Because it takes time. You have, to, you have to look at the course in detail and you have to go through all of these different sections in the rubric and make comments. Um, so that's nice. Yeah, and academics are already so loaded with uh, with work. So in a way, I think these uh, maybe even fairly small incentives um, probably motivate quite a lot to yeah. to do the extra work. Yeah. yeah. This uh, then uh, I had a, a question in mind uh, re regarding you. You mentioned quite many times the the pandemic. And that has been uh, amongst us for, for the two two years now. So, uh, a question about the, when you are anticipating the the, the return to the so-called new normal or, or what whatever it's called. So, do you see a kind of like transition back to the maybe the the face-to-face -face model, or is it that you have so many new students enrolling all the time that you actually just have to keep on on this? Uh, this online learning and how is it with the hybrid model? Because usually that is considered quite a task uh, and demanding way of, of educating that you have a group here and you have the group in the distant and you have to keep the, the social interaction and the motivation up in, in different localities. So how do you see this kind of like the future that will will you be taking a step back to the maybe more traditional or or keep on doing this way? Uh, I think that's a question on everyone's minds. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I definitely think there are some people who just want to get back in the classroom and do the, the traditional face to face. That's what they're most comfortable with. Um, but recently at our university, I think we've come up with um, we've identified five modalities instead of we used, we used to have face to face hybrid and online. And now we've added two more, which are more related to like the live stream, like they're kind of variations of hybrid. So I, I would say we'll probably keep a lot of what we've done, but kind of, there will there will need to be some kind of balance um, to meet faculty preferences and student preferences. Um, but I think definitely mo moving forward, um, the, the live stream model where, where you had students in the classroom and you had students at home, ha I think people aren't too much a fan of that one. <laughs> it's just too hard mm -hmm. to coordinate. Um, but yeah, I think it's opened up more more possibilities and more technology use uh, and and because of who our students are and the increasing enrollments and more students are used to different more students are used to more flexibility now than they were before because during you know the past year and a half they haven't necessarily had to attend class because they could listen to a recording or um tune in later or whatever. So I think it will, I think there will be some returning to kind of face-to-face, -face, but I think more options will, the greater flexibility will will continue to increase as well. Just yeah. my, my guess. <laughs> yeah, yes, of course it's difficult to say how long people are able to, to maintain like so many different options that uh, they, they want to maybe return into more uh, streamlined uh, way of delivery at some point. Yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. Then uh, it, please please think of a, uh, of a question to Maureen. But while you do that, I had I had one observation in your um, fascinating presentation that you mentioned many many times the instructional designers. Yes. And uh, in, in Finland, we call them maybe learning designers, but it, it is really the same. And uh, what was really um, an interesting observation from the massive online open courses, the MOOCs in, in Finland in, in the uh, engineering studies. So, of course, we have detected the same uh, problem as everywhere else that the the people enroll the courses, but so few graduate or finish the courses. But they really done uh, done a, a terrific job with the learning designers or or instructional designers. That from from something around twenty percent of of graduation, they were able to reach until eighty percent oh. by really observing what you just said earlier about the critical points on the learner's path. And then what were the kind of like the student experience? And then they detected really that what were the obstacles in learning and added that flexibility and maybe some game-like solutions. And we're just basically listening to the students that how do they feel while they're studying and really picking up all, all of those feedback and making adjustments. And I think it really, like also in your case, really is, a, is an evidence that uh, if we make an investment on the learning design and the, uh -huh. the instruction also for staff members, that uh, these kind of uh, experiments you can try or these are the good, the so-called good practices or good examples so the better we can only get with our delivery and also the graduation uh, levels or, or finishing the course. Yeah. So that was, that was re really remarkable finding also in your presentation and, and your exper experience. Yeah. So we are about to conclude. Uh, any other questions you have in mind for Maureen? So I think you just open your, your video and, and uh, the mic and please please ask. 
I just had a, a comment really. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. Um, I just had a comment really about, um, it's funny how before COVID and we were all forced to teach online, people would say, oh, I can't teach this class online. You know, you just can't learn and teach statistics online. And, but we had to, you know, or, you know, we can't offer comprehensive exams remotely or take home, but then we had to. And so now we're looking at all this and saying, well, yes, we can teach statistics online. We can offer take home for comprehensive exams. There are ways of doing it efficiently. And um, it's just interesting how we really have evolved through that, I think in a, in a positive way. And just, as you mentioned, being really, really flexible and, and observing students and, and what works for them. And, and you mentioned you've got like 81% of students working. So I'm sure all these different options for them, is, you know, they're really helpful. Yeah, no, great, great point. I totally agree. We've, we've discovered things that we can do things that previously we didn't think we could. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just thought that we, we could never do those things, that it's <laughs> impossible to have an, have an exam online. Yeah. Right. Like, like Susan mentioned as an example, but, but we just developed those, those ways. Exactly. Yeah. Any any other questions? I, I was thinking about actually Carmen, <laughs> who is uh, who is in our network, and uh, I was just when I was listening to you, I thought that that the you can um, so many things that we are kind of like uh, promoting as as the network. You you had mentioned in your presentation, for example, the widening participation uh, scheme, the mm -hmm. the different um, ways of uh, facilitating learning of, of the people with migrant background. So, so you, you actually have a quite a kind of a, what might be for some, they would say a challenging student body. We do. We, yes. we are actually what's called open admission. We admit anyone. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we do need to have a lot of student support um, and, and reach out to students. And we hire professors who are very focused on teaching and helping students as well. Yeah, they, they are ready to, to make that extra effort to, to get even the, the learners who, who might not have the same background as, as others to the same, yeah. same level. And I think that that is some, something called um, I would say uh, a vocation. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's uh, occupation turning turning into a vocation. Yeah. I was just wondering something because you get got the the, the topic out, and then I was thinking, if uh, in your experience, Maureen, the technology is a problem of inclusion, or or not? If if technology is a problem a challenge for some students in the US because in, in Europe, in some cases, it could definitely be. It is, it definitely is. Um, you know, in some households, they may not have the internet or they may all be sharing one computer and have multiple family members who need to use it. Um, Yeah, I, that's definitely something I haven't heard too. Oh, I think we may, I'm not sure exactly sure how we address that, how we've been addressing that, um, to be honest. But yeah, definitely something to monitor and make sure students have access. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we do have computer, we have computer availability on campus, but that means students have to come on campus, which isn't convenient, so. Yeah, sometimes you can hire some, some, uh, some of the technical inf infrastructure to students like cameras or recording devices or something. So I think those kind of approaches have been developed in, in some universities that you can loan some equipment to make interviews or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah very good.
I think we have reached the, the time uh, time limit. So thank you so much, uh, Maureen, for a great presentation. And I do hope that we, we will be able to see you again sometimes in the UK events. Me too. That'd be great. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I enjoyed our visit today. Yes. <laughs> and uh, hopefully many people will turn also tomorrow as we continue this week of flexible learning. So thank you so much and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.